so, so that everybody knows over the last uh, few years, and it's, it's probably been about four or five years, um, I made a commitment um, that when we started off the new year, that every new year I would do a series here at Grace on who we are and what we believe and, um, and why we do the things that we do. And I can tell you over a number of years, it's been hugely, hugely successful um, for, for a number of people. Um, you know, we always have first time visitors um, at the beginning of the year because, you know, it's the beginning of the year and maybe you promised your mom that you'd go back to church, you know, at the beginning of every year or, or maybe circumstances bring you in. Um, obviously, opening up a new campus this year at the beginning of the year um, brings people in. But I know there's always first time visitors that come back at the beginning of every year and, and, I, and I try to put myself in your shoes if you were a first time visitor here. Um, I wouldn't want to have to wait like for months and months and months to figure out what was, what was going on. So if you're new here um, this, this weekend, and if you're new online this weekend, I just want to say this is a great time to, to be with us because in a f- just a few several weeks, you're going to learn a lot about who we are and why we do the things that we do. And it'll help you to make a really good decision as to whether or not Grace um, is the church for you. And I mean, you know, as a pastor, I want everybody to come to Grace, but I realize that Grace may not be the church for everybody. And as a pastor, um, I want what's best for you. So this is a good time for you if you're here to, to, to learn sort of who we are and what we're doing and, and to be able to make a decision as to whether or not Grace is a is a church for you. It's also great for people who have been attending for less than a year. Um, one of the things over the years as we start a new series and talk about who we are and what we're doing and our core values and all those things, one of the things that, that, that I have noticed is that people who joined us in the middle of the year are so thankful <clears throat> when we do these series is because they go, okay, great, now we you know, understand everything. And this year obviously would be different because many people joined us online while we weren't meeting and, and then we opened back up and, and, and now we're here and, and this will be a great time for you. And also it is a wonderful thing for everybody here at Grace. I, I'm convinced that leadership matters and I'm convinced that clear direction matters. And so for, for me at the beginning of every year, I think it's hugely important that we go back and revisit as a church why we do what we do, why, why we say we want to reach the unchurched by being intentional neighbors that reflect Christ. And so um, I think that th- this will be a wonderful next few weeks as we, as we talk about this new series that we entitled DNA. And you might wonder where I got that from. Well, last year, and, and some of you all may remember this, um, last year we started off the year with a series called Culture. And man, I'm going to tell you, the staff got together, we printed stuff, we printed cards, we had, you know, all kinds of groups getting ready to go forward. And about the time we got done with culture, we got coroned. And, um, and so we weren't able to push all that forward. And it, yeah, it's like, man, that was a really good series. And so I never do this, but if, if this is your church, um, it would be so good to go back and get online on our um, mobile app. You go back and watch those eight um, weeks of services on culture because that was really good material. And I feel like it, we, we said it and then, you know, we just, the, the year just sort of pulled, pulled away. So I thought this year, what am I going to do? And I was reading several, uh, um, about a month ago, I was reading and, and this DNA, I was reading something about DNA and, and a, a definition of DNA was in what I was reading. And, and the definition said this, said that DNA is a molecule that contains the genetic instructions for the development, functioning, growth, and reproduction of all known organisms. And I was like, yes, that's what, that's what we should do for, for the beginning of the year. Let's talk about our DNA. Let's talk about the, 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 the genetic information at grace that allows us to do the things that, that, that we wanna do as a church. I mean, we wanna develop people, but you know this, and everybody knows this, you can develop wrongly. You know, you, you just, just because you're developing doesn't mean that you're developing right. And we wanna develop in the right way. We wanna develop in a godly way. We wanna develop in a biblical way. And so talking about who we are and our core values and the DNA that flows through this church helps us to develop, it helps us to function properly, it helps us to grow, and it helps us to reproduce. And what we wanna do is we wanna make sure that everything that we do here at Grace is biblically based and is, and is pleasing to the Lord. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about who we are and 
why we do the things that we do and, and, and get everybody on the same page so we can go forward because I, I believe that if we look around the world, we can look around and be dismayed and we can, we can look around and be depressed or we can look as Christians who know what the end of the book says, that knows that we're on the team that wins and we can say, you know what, there is an incredible opportunity right outside of these doors to reach people with the gospel and I wanna make sure as your pastor, we know where we're going, that there is good leadership here and, and most importantly, that we are pleasing as a church to God. So that's what we're gonna talk about. I think it'll be um, enjoyable, I think it'll be fun. But, but then what happened is, is we came out of 2020 and I, and I think, look, you, you know, maybe some of you all wanna act like you're stronger than, than, than you actually are. Let me just be the one to be vulnerable and honest. 2020 was rough. It was a rough year. You know, um, I, I had never spent so much time with all of my kids at home as during quarantine. And, um, you know, and uh, I was trying my best to call some people at the church, see if they wanted to take them for a couple of weeks. But, you know, but uh, I'm just joking. But, 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 you know, 2020 was tough. And we came out of 2020, and I think all of us, and we hit a new year, I think all of us were like, man, you know, this is going to be good and, and whatever. And then we had this last week in, in our country. And, and regardless of your feelings on that, we all feel it. Like all of us do, in one way or the other. And I know we're polarized, and I know we're pulled in every direction, but, but all of us feel it. And, and I, I just started thinking, you know, okay, I'm going in this new series, um, and, and, and the world feels like it's just falling apart. You know, Chip, you gotta, you gotta help everybody here. You gotta, you gotta lead well. You gotta encourage everybody. And so what I wanna do this weekend, and, and it, will, it will dovetail into our DNA series because it's all about, you know, who we are and what we do as a church. But I wanna to talk to you about what I think the most important institution in the world is, and that's the church. It's God's people. Can I tell you something? This world is not going to be changed by what goes on in the White House. It's gonna be changed by what goes on in God's house. And we're gonna to have to figure out how to get out of all the clutter and the white noise and get focused on what God has called us to do. And as a pastor, it's, it's almost alarming sometimes because when you talk about the church to people and you ask them, tell me about the church, tell me what you know about the church, th these are things that are said. It's a place of rules and regulations. That's what it is, Chip. It's just a place, you know, all you guys do is you put together all these hoops and you gotta jump through all these things and you gotta do this and don't do that. Don't dip, don't chew, don't run with those that do, you know, all that stuff. And, you know, it, it's all this rules. And, and that's just not true. I mean, I'm sorry that maybe in, in, in your life and those watching online, I'm sorry if, if somehow people have made you to think that what we do is all about the things that we're against and the things that we don't like because that's not really what the church is. Other people say, I know what the church is. It's a place where all they want is your money. That's what they want. They want your money. I mean, come on, Chip, look around here. It's a nice building, man. Somewhere y'all had to take up an offering. You had to do something. Can I tell you something? The church, I'm not saying churches have not, but the church is not the place that's looking for people's money. In fact, when we take up an offering, we're not looking for anything from somebody. We're looking for you when we do that. We, we believe giving is something that is great. We believe that you know and I know deep down inside, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. But it's not about money. It's, it's not about that. And some other people will be like, I know what the church is about. It's a courtroom. That's what the church is. It's a courtroom. Because I've walked in and I, I saw everybody looking at me, seeing what kind of tattoo I had or the, the nose ring I had. I, I knew, I saw, I saw those, those laser eyes staring me down. Because the church is a courtroom. It's not a courtroom. I'm not saying it sometimes doesn't feel like that, but that's not what the church is. You can also talk to people and say, I'll tell you what the church is. It's a group of people who believe in some make-believe fairy tale God. That's what it is. A bunch of people who get together and believe in some pie in the sky deity that doesn't exist. None of those things are true. But what I do know is this, is when I talk to people about what's a church, oftentimes they don't know. I mean, the church is not a building. The church is people. It's people that have been redeemed by the Lord. And what's interesting is if you've been to Israel with me, you know this. 
If you haven't been to Israel with me, I'm sorry we're not going this year, but we will start again next year, God willing, and we'll, we'll continue to do it year after year. Um, it's, it's a great trip. But if, if you go to Israel, you, you, will, you will go with me to Caesarea Philippi, and you will stand in front of this huge rock where Peter, the apostle, Matthew 16, first person that says, Jesus, I know who you are. Jesus says, who, who, who's, who, who's everybody say I am? He says, I know. I know who you are. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. He said, you didn't come to that by your own conclusion. That was revealed to you. And he says, and you know what? I'm gonna build, you're Peter. And on that rock, that confession, that statement that you made that I was the Christ, I'm going to build my church. And if anybody knew anything about the church, it would have been that man. And he wrote two epistles to people in the first century and by way of them to you and me today. And in 1 Peter chapter one, if you go back and read it, and I would encourage you to do that, go back and read it. Um, he talks about how we come to faith and, and, and what that means and what that looks like. But in chapter two of his epistle, he tells you and me about the church. He tells us what the church is. And I just want us to take a little bit of time, go through a passage of scripture. If you've never been to Grace before, this is sort of what we do. We're, we're people that look at a lot of scripture talk about scripture and then I try to do some take homes to make it practical for everybody um, but, but I don't get up here and try to preach my opinion or my theories I try to say God what does your word say and how can I best teach this to your people um, and so I, I want us to maybe look at this you know this weekend those online too um, look with us uh, and, and then let, let's see if maybe we can learn a little bit more about God's church and, and then we'll continue to talk about this as we talk about who we are as a local congregation here in, in Sarasota. So this is, what, this is what Peter says. Peter says that you've been saved and, 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 as, and as followers of Jesus, you wanna know more about him. And then he says this, he says, as you come to him, now he's not talking about as you come to him like when we talk about becoming a Christian. He, 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 he's talking to Christians. He's saying you collectively, it's not, it's not a singular you, it's a plural you. It's, 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 a, it's a group because the church isn't me. The church is us. The Lord's prayer is not my father, which art in heaven. It is our father. That's why we do this thing together. You know, and there's Christians like, I'm a Lone Ranger. Remember, Lone Ranger had Tonto, okay? So, you know, we, 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 all, we all do this together. He says, as you come to him, when, when we meet, when we gather, when, when, when we do what we do, as we come to him, he says, a living stone rejected by men but in the sight of God chosen and precious. And one of the things I like to do is I like to highlight things. This living stone, I like to circle that so that you, you, you're looking here at scripture. There's no such thing as a living stone. That's an oxymoron. Stones are dead. They're, they're inanimate objects. But he says, you're coming to Jesus is a living stone. Why does he say that? Because he's gonna, he's gonna tell us that Jesus is the foundational stone of what we do. That he's the cornerstone, is what he's gonna call him in a minute. And a cornerstone, when they would build buildings back in antiquity, that cornerstone, if it was off, the entire building was off. He says, you're coming to him as a living stone. He says, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. Wayne Grudem in his commentary on 1 Peter says this. He says, the fact that Christ is the living stone shows at once his superiority to an Old Testament temple made of dead stones and reminds Christians that there can be no longing for that old way of approach to God for this way is far better. He's, he's, he's saying, hey, you remember the, the, the Old Testament temple? I mean, Peter was there. He's like, Jesus, look at all these stones. And Jesus says, not one of these stones is not gonna be thrown down. You can read that, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. He says, he says this is different. This is, a, this is a different deal. We're coming to him as a living stone. Listen what he says. You yourselves, like living stones, 
You, you're, you're these stones too that, that, are, that, that, are, that are being built, that are being fashioned on, on this living stone of Jesus. He says, you're being built up as a spiritual house. Circle that. That, that, that this isn't a temple like a building because the church isn't a building. We gather in buildings. The early church gathered in houses. The early church would gather in synagogues from time to time. But, but we're people. The church is people. You and me, followers of Jesus that come to him realizing he's a living stone and we are stones as well that are being fashioned together, built together as a spiritual house we're being built all of us are being put together not just here but in other churches in the area in churches in Florida and in the United States and around the world God is building his church with you and me people who are living stones listen to be a holy priesthood you and me are called to do in the Old Testament, remember they had the priest and you, you, it was just a select group of people and you had to have the right lineage. Most of us would have never been priests. We would have never been able to do it. And the priests were able to, to, to make sacrifices and what they did, they connected people to God. There was only a small group of them. You and me, those who come to Jesus, those who are followers of Jesus, we're called to be built on the living stone of Jesus because he's the one who gives the way. He's the one who builds the temple. But he's not building a building. It's not, it's not stones. It's you and me. You and me are people being fashioned together to build a house for the Lord. And we're called to be a holy priesthood. You and me are called to connect people to God to offer spiritual sacrifices, prayer, forgiveness, evangelism, loving, caring, giving. We're called to be these stones that are placed together with a focus on being built on Jesus so that we, you and me, can be a holy priesthood. Can you imagine? imagine if every Christian in America realized that they were called to be a priest? We were called to connect people to God. Maybe we would say things differently. Maybe we would fight about different things. Maybe, maybe the way we talk about others would change. That if we realized we're called to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable not just what we want to do, but acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. He says, for it stands in scripture, behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, that Jesus is the foundational stone that shows the building the way that it should be built. And he says, and whoever believes in him. Th this, is, this is the message of the church. The message of the church is not all the clutter and all the white noise. The message of the church is let me tell you how to settle eternity once and for all and it's whether or not you believe in him. It's not the rules and the regulations, not that there's not ethical things that we should do as Christians, but it's not those things that save you and me. What save you and me, what make us Christians is what Christ has done for you and me and whether or not we believe he is the only one that can save us from our sins and give us eternal life. And that is the message of the church. It's who we're called to be. And he says, if you believe in him, you will never be put to shame. So many Christians, I see it in their eyes. I see it in what they say. They feel like God's let us down. They feel like God's letting the world go crazy. They, can I tell you something? If you are a child of God, don't go by what you see. Go by what God has told you. He will never let you, his son and daughter, be put to shame, ever. Now listen, I'm trying. So the honor, notice here, shame and honor. 
a society that we don't live in, the honor and shame society. But back then they knew this. He says, you'll never be put to shame. You're gonna be honored because the honor is for you who, who believe. You're gonna be honored because you believe. But for those who don't believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. They rejected that stone. They're gonna build their building on something else. But the, but, the, but the building to build on is a person and his name is Jesus and we come to him as a living stone. He says, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Can I, can I tell you something? If people are going to stumble and if they're going to take offense at what we do as a church, may it never be for anything else than preaching Jesus. I don't want people to stumble and to take offense because I just did something in my own strength or my own opinion or, or tried to cram something down somebody's throat. Remember, Jesus said, blessed if you're persecuted for me, for my name's sake. He didn't say blessed or if you're persecuted for some of the dumb things we did. Can I get an amen on that? Okay, he says, he's a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. He says, and they stumble. They stumble because they're not building their lives on Jesus and maybe you're here, maybe you tuned in online. Maybe you're here right now because maybe you're building your life on something other than Jesus and you find yourself stumbling regularly. Peter says they stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. Can I tell you something? You will always be destined to stumble when you disobey God's word. And then he goes on to say this. Listen, this is so great. He says, but you, you, plural, those who come to the living stone, you're a chosen race. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation, a people for his own possession. For what? What are we, what are we chosen for? What are we a royal priesthood for? What are we a holy nation for? To go fight about the clutter? to go argue about the white noise. He, the good thing about the word of God is it always tells us this is why we're chosen. This is why we're a priesthood. This is why we're a holy nation. This is why we're a people of his own possession. Listen, here's, what, here's why. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You wanna know what the church is supposed to do? The church is supposed to be people that come to Jesus on a regular basis and approach him because we love him and we honor him. And what we wanna do is we wanna make sure that in everything that we do, we are building on him, but what our message is and what we say to people is very simple. Let me tell you about the person that changed my life. Let me tell you about his excellencies he called me out of darkness and he brought me into his marvelous light. I can tell you as your pastor, back when I was a teenager, the Lord took me out of darkness and brought me into his marvelous light. That is the message of the church. We proclaim his excellencies. And I love this. Once you were not a people but now you are God's people. Isn't it interesting how we forget where we were before Jesus saved us and we hardly ever give those that are there the same grace that he gave us? Maybe, maybe we need to rethink this. Maybe this is why Peter wrote this. Maybe this is, he's wanting us to see something here. He says, once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Now, let's... Let's do some take-homes here. We, we just read through a passage of scripture and now let's do a little bit more of a reflective, thoughtful process about what we read. First, the church, which is people, which is you and me, followers of Jesus, is built as a spiritual house. We're a spiritual house. We're told that you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. What we do here is spiritual. We're being built spiritually. We're being built into an edifice that's not a stone, that's not a building, but is something that God is doing marvelously. So here's, here's the reality. The church collectively is comprised of living stones that are being built and fashioned together for the Lord's purpose, not each doing what they want to do, 
but following the direction of the cornerstone, following the direction of Jesus. We're being built and fashioned to proclaim his glory. That's what we do. We talk about him. We don't talk about our thoughts on this particular thing or that. We talk about him. He's the only one who can save. And what we do when we meet, whether it's online or whether it's here, it matters. It matters because we're being equipped and we're being taught and we're being built through God's word to become the people in the spiritual house that he wants us to be. Not only that, but the church is built as a spiritual house made up of those who were far from God but have been redeemed. Sometimes it's, we forget that. Sometimes we forget where we were before we met God. We need to remember that because once we weren't those people, but now we are. Once we had not received mercy, but now we have received mercy. And, and, that, and that is the play that the Christians should have in the way that we approach people outside of the walls of this building is that I know where you were and what didn't reach me was somebody telling me how bad I was and how I didn't measure up and how much God hated me and all of those things. What, what reached me was the gospel. What reached you and me was somebody told you and me that Jesus died for our sins and he rose again on the third day. In that message, something happened on the inside. And we all know that. We, we, all of us who know Jesus know that that was the thing. It's what Paul says in Romans 1.16. He says, it's the gospel that's the power of God unto salvation. And we're, we're, we're called to remember it's people that were taken out of darkness into his marvelous light. Third, the church is a spiritual house where we are priestly mediators. I wanna, I wanna just take a moment here Think about this for a second. We're called to be a holy priesthood. That's what we're called to be, which means this, that we're built to be a place that connects people with God. Think about this just for a moment. If every single one of us that goes to grace and calls grace home, if in every job that we went to, every neighbor that we talked to, every, every family member that we went to, Every time we got together as a group, whatever it may be, if, if we saw ourselves as a person that was to connect someone to God, how would that alter the way we talk to people and the way we treat people? You and me are called to be a holy priesthood. That's what the church is. It's people that come to Jesus as living stones that are being built on him, the cornerstone, that understand that we're to proclaim his excellencies. And that's my fourth point, is the church is built as a spiritual house that proclaims Jesus. I've been doing this for 10 years. I've had opposition. I've had people say, I need to say more. I've had all those things. I can tell you this, I ain't changing anything I'm doing because I know the one who saves and I don't wanna do anything to put any obstacle in front of any of you or any of you online to make sure that you hear the gospel because I can tell you this, if one person in this building gets eternity settled in the next 100 years, then everything that we did here was worth it because those, those souls matter. And, he says that we're to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Here's, here's the reality. We are the community that God uses to bring dead people to life. Every single year over the last number of years, I have brought this book up with me. I was 19 years old, I was at Lee College. I was studying to be a pastor and this was my first class on pastoral care and counseling. The book's worn, the spine of the book is not the color of the book because it's lights hit it and it's discolored the book. But I remember 19 years old, I remember chapter one, when I opened it up, I read and I stopped and I cried. And I said, God, 
if I'm ever a pastor, ever, please don't let me forget this story. I read it every year. It might be the second or third week of every year. It might be the fourth week. It might be the first week. I read it every year. And can I tell you something? I hope that it speaks to you. But I read it for me. I read it to remind me of why I do what I do and why I preach the way I preach and why this church is the way that it is. And I hope, as it has for years, spoken deeply to people, I hope you hear where my heart is coming from and why we want to reach the unchurched by being intentional neighbors that reflect Christ and why we do things the way that we do it. Let me read you the story. On a dangerous seacoast where shipwrecks often occur, there was once a crude little life-saving station. The building was just a hut and there was only one boat. But a few devoted members kept a constant watch over the sea and with no thought of themselves went out day and night tirelessly searching for the lost. Many lives were saved by this wonderful little station so that it became famous. Some of those who were saved and various others in the surrounding area wanted to become associated with the station and give of their time and money and effort to support its work. New boats were bought, new crews trained. The little life-saving station grew. Some of its members of the life-saving station were unhappy that the building was so crude and poorly equipped. They felt that a more comfortable place should be provided as the first refuge of those saved from the sea. So they replaced the emergency cots with beds and put better furniture in the enlarged building. Now the life-saving station became a popular gathering place for its members and they decorated it beautifully and furnished it exquisitely because they used it as sort of a club. Fewer members were now interested in going to sea on life-saving missions, so they hired lifeboat crews to do that work. The life-saving motif still prevailed in the club's decoration and there was a liturgical lifeboat in the room where the club initiations were held. About this time, a large ship was wrecked off the coast and the hired crews brought in boatloads of cold, wet, and half-drowned people. They were dirty. They were sick. And they had different colored skin. The beautiful new club was now in chaos. So the property committee immediately had a shower house built outside the club where victims of shipwreck could be cleaned up before they came inside. At the next meeting, there was a split in the club membership. Most of the members wanted to stop the club's life-saving activities as being unpleasant and a hindrance to the normal social life of the club. Some members insisted upon a life-saving as their primary purpose and pointed out that they were still called a life-saving station. But they were finally voted down and told if they wanted to save the lives of all the various kinds of people that were shipwrecked in those waters, they could go build their own life-saving station down the coast. They did. And as the years went by, the new station experienced the same changes that had occurred in the old. It evolved into a club and yet another life-saving station was founded. History continued to repeat itself. And if you visit that sea coast today, you will find a number of exclusive clubs along that shore. Shipwrecks are frequent in those waters. But most of the people drown I'm committed to Grace Community Church being a life saving station we're going to reach people we're going to tell them about Jesus we're not going to be a club of the things that we like and the things that we want to hear we're going to preach the gospel we're going to preach the good news because this world needs Jesus and it needs the church to arise with the same passion and message that it did in the first century that changed the world. You want to see the world change? 
start here in God's house. You want to see the world change? Go tell people about Jesus when you leave. You want to see the world change? Get on your knees and pray. You want to see the world change? Get in the word of God and let it change you. But if you want to see the world change, the only one who can change a person's heart and make them a new creation is the Galilean carpenter that went to a cross and died for you and me, you and I's sins and rose again on the third day so that we could have eternal life. That is the message of the church and that will be the message of Grace Community Church and we will be a life-saving station as long as I am here and as long as these lights are on, we're gonna do those things. And so here's what I wanna do. I wanna ask you a question. Maybe you came here, maybe you're online. Maybe you showed up here and you're not sure. You're not quite sure about your eternity. You you, you don't know for sure if you died tonight where you would spend eternity. I want to help you settle that once and for all. Would would you, nobody's going to embarrass you. Nobody's going to come and stick a microphone in front of you. Would you just bow your heads and hearts for just a minute? Those online as well. If you would like to leave here tonight and you would like to know that you've settled eternity, I want to make sure that you have that opportunity. That opportunity is found in believing that Jesus Christ died for your sins and rose again on the third day. And I want to give you the opportunity to settle that. So here's what I want you to do. If you're at your seat and that's you or you're at home and you're watching and that's you, What I want you to do is I want you to say and pray with me. It doesn't have to be the exact words I pray. It's the attitude of the heart. But it's simply, Lord, I know that I have been building on some other stone other than you. I know that my life is not really fashioned and formed after Jesus. And I know because of that, I know I've done a lot of things that I shouldn't have done. There's no question, God, I've made a lot of errors in my life. I've done a lot of things I shouldn't have done. But Lord, I want you to forgive me of those things. I want you to forgive me of my sins because I believe you died on a cross for my sins. And I believe you rose again on the third day so that I could have eternal life. And I wanna know, I wanna settle that once and for all. I wanna know when I walk out of here that I am a new creation and that I'm gonna build on the cornerstone of Jesus. If you prayed that prayer, please let somebody know who's got a gray shirt on so we can get you into next steps and we can help you grow in your faith. But what I wanna do now is I wanna finish the prayer and then we're gonna sing a song. I wanna pray, God, I pray that as we open up this new building, I pray that you would bless it. I pray that you would bless us in our coming and our going. I pray that you would bless us by walking in front of us and behind us. I pray, God, that you would raise this church up to be a mighty army for you. And Lord, I pray blessing on everyone here and all those watching online for your glory and for your honor. Lord, let us understand the depth of your love for us.